Well, uh, good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Matt, and I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and before the sermon, I, if you don't know, uh, this week marks a big transition in the lives of our students and parents uh, and caregivers as uh, it's back to school this week. It's hard to believe we're always, already at this point in August, and some of you parents are celebrating and can't wait, and others of you are filled with all sorts of things that come with that. And uh, Let's just take a few moments to pray. Uh, for our kids. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, as we enter this week into a new school year, we want to bless our kids, our teachers, EAs, faculty, our parents, grandparents, and caregivers. We bless them in your name to experience your peace. Jesus, would you give our kids who are feeling anxious and nervous about what this week will bring and what this year will bring would you bless them with peace in your name right now? We pray there'd be a deep sense of your presence going before them and with them. And even walking into school for the first time, would they notice you holding their hand? We pray for the, the kids who are excited and joy-filled about these coming days. May that excitement and joy continue. We pray that this week would be a great week. We pray for friends uh, for our kids and that our kids would be good friends that they would have the eyes of your kingdom to look out for those who are needing, uh, needing a friend, needing someone to care, someone to be present. And we pray for our kids that are needing a friend, someone to care, and someone to be present. We pray for others to have eyes of the kingdom to see them. We pray for compassion and curiosity for our kids. We pray for those who find school a difficult place to be, that there be uh, people to see them, to make accommodations for them, and to help them. We pray uh, against bullying in our schools. And we pray uh, the kids that would have that inclination, that would just be taken away and that uh, your blessing would rest on them instead. And we know so much of that is working out other tension in their lives, and so would you come and meet them in that tension now. We pray for our teachers, EA and faculty. Is there so much to learn, so much to catch up on and get ready for? We pray uh, your peace over them. We pray joy in their work, perseverance in hard days, and just a dose of your wisdom and creativity. They would know who to, who to reach out to, who to see, how to best meet kids in all the different places they find them in. And so, Spirit of living God, would you fall fresh on them too? We pray for our homeschool families as they transition back into uh, a new routine and rhythm. We pray joy over these families. We pray your delight. We pray wisdom for, for our parents uh, who, are, who are teaching at the same time and all the intricacies that can bring. And so would you bless them too? Would you bless our parents, grandparents, adults who help with a deep sense of your peace? We give you our worries. We trust our kids with you. Would you help us to, to care for our kids well? So Jesus, we bring all this to you, all the things that we're feeling that we don't know how to express, and we pray that you would you'd be kind and compassionate to us. So we love you. Amen. When we think about the good life, what comes to mind? If you scroll Instagram or whatever it is that people are using these days, it comes down often to experiences to getting to go on vacations, to traveling the world, some sort of hashtag about how they're blessed because of this or that. Or we think about the Alberta dream with having lots of stuff, good vehicles, well-paying jobs, and all the toys. We think about all sorts of things, typically marked by material possessions, health, all wonderful things. And we tell ourselves, and Alberta and Hollywood tell ourselves, and our culture tells us, that the good life is measured by good things. Getting those things you want, what you hope for. But let's be honest, it's not just our culture, or Alberta, or Hollywood that tells us this, is it? It's also the church. We read books and are told by preachers on TV that God's blessing looks like an abundance too. But specifically, an abundance of both health and wealth. 
that if we're under God's blessing, we won't get sick or have difficulties or suffer. And we'll get all those things we've ever wanted. Who here has heard any of this before? This question of who is blessed or how do you live the good life is not a new question. It's an ancient one. The Greek philosophers wrestled with it. The Jewish wisdom literature did as well. And countless individuals throughout the ages and cultures have all asked this question of what is the good life and who is really blessed? And how can we even tell anyways? It's also a question that we as a church grapple with constantly. We've heard Jesus' statement about how he's come to give us life to the full, and so we want to live into it. We want to live into fullness of life for everyone by practicing the way of Jesus together. But is fullness of life just about things and stuff? About having a life free from troubles, or is it about something else altogether? This question of what is the good life, what is fullness, look like is why we keep coming back to the gospel of Luke week after week. Because if fullness of life is found by practicing the way of Jesus, we've got to learn who Jesus is and what his way looks like. And so we come to this gospel written by Luke, a Gentile, on the outside of the Jewish faith who keeps writing to to outsiders saying, it's okay, there's a place in your kingdom, in Jesus' kingdom for you. And we keep coming to this over and over again because we want to see who Jesus is, and what he has to say to us. And so again, let's just stop and pray. Jesus, as we come to the scriptures this morning now, we want to hear from you. Remember Peter's words that say, where else would we go? Only you have everlasting life. And so your words bring life, and we want to hear your words. So would you come and give us ears to hear what you have to say and eyes to see how you're moving? Spirit of living God, would you come and fall fresh on us now? Amen. So this morning, uh, we're continuing on where we left off last week. Last week, we we were reading in Luke 6, and we read, read about how Jesus had this big day. And on this big day, he was going to choose his 12 apostles, the heralds of his kingdom. We learned about how he was going to come down from mountain and heal and bless a bunch of sick people and people who are demon-possessed and bring uh, freedom for them. And then we read that he was going to have this big sermon, Luke's sermon, on the plain. And so in preparation for this, what did he do? He went up on a mountain and prayed to the Father all night long. Not in a restless kind of way, but in a way of rest because this was his regular practice. And so Jesus prayed, he came down from the mountain, chose his apostles, and then he spoke to the desperate crowds and to his disciples. And we read this. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that's how your ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, For that's how your ancestors treated the prophets. The word of the Lord. It's one of those ones where you're kind of like awkwardly like, thanks be to God, I think. This is Luke's version of the Beatitudes. Now, the Beatitudes are one of the most famous passages of Scripture. We, We hear about them all over the place. And if you're familiar with them, then you probably just found yourself confused at what I was reading. Because we're familiar with Matthew's version of the Beatitudes. In Matthew, we read, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they'll be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they'll see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. Blessed are the persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
what I previously read in Luke doesn't quite sound like that, does it? In Matthew, it's the poor in spirit. In Luke, it's the poor. In Matthew, it's hungering and thirsting for righteousness. In Luke, it's those who hunger. In Matthew, it's those who mourn will be comforted. In Luke, it's those who weep will laugh. And really, the only one that's essentially the same is the, same, is the last one, which is all about being persecuted. Now, why the difference? Well, as we talked before, these are different eyewitnesses accounts. And so people remember things differently. And then on top of this, it might not even be the same sermon. Jesus probably went around the countryside and said a lot of the same things. It just wasn't recorded over and over again. Now, the Beatitudes in Matthew are brilliant, and to be honest, they're like one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And that, but that's not what we're exploring today. Instead, we're exploring Luke's. And to be honest, I'd probably rather look at Matthew's. Because Matthews are easier to deal with. They still challenge us in how we see the world, but not to the extent that Luke's does. And Luke's get a little bitey at times, don't they? What Luke has to say is hard. Not only are there blessings, it'd be one thing to read about blessed are the poor and the hunger, hungry and the weeping and blessed are the rejected. But there's a whole other thing when there's woes right afterwards. Woes are warnings of impending judgment, drawn from the teachings of the Old Testament prophets who would speak woe against those in power who were using their power to abuse others. And Luke here balances blessing with woe. They're opposites. Where the poor are blessed, the rich are under judgment. Where the hungry are blessed, the well-fed are under judgment. Where the weep are blessed, those who laugh are under judgment. Where the rejected are blessed, those who are honored are under judgment. It's hard not to read those things and see some similarities to ourselves. It seems that according to Jesus, the answer to the question of who is really blessed are the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the rejected. And not only that, but the rich, the well-fed, the laughing, and honored are not blessed. They're actually in danger of being under judgment. Now, it could be really easy to say, okay, everybody, Here's the way we experience the fullness of life for everyone by practicing the way of Jesus. Just give everything away. Go on a hunger strike. Don't have any joy. Make sure you don't smile. Cry a lot if you can. For those of you who are 90s kids like myself, listen to a lot of Dashboard Confessional. And make sure that people know you're with Jesus. Because if they do, they'll reject you. Is that actually what Jesus has in mind here, do you think? Many have assumed so, but I think there's more going on, and so let's explore this together. And so to do so, we need to begin with the question is, what is the role of the Beatitudes? Are they instructions on how we get blessed? Are they virtues to achieve, values to reach for? Or are they something entirely different? To the begin with, we need to start by defining our terms. What is meant by the kingdom of God? Now, we talk about this a lot but around here, but not everybody maybe has heard this. Jesus' primary message is the good news of the kingdom of God. This was his gospel. The kingdom of God has drawn near. And as such, it's a major and main theme of the book of Luke. The kingdom of God is the rule of <clears throat> the kingdom of God is the rule of God is now present in the person of Jesus. It's what we're seeking when we say, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying that the now available rule of God would be made known in all the aspects of our world, and that our world and our lives would be congruent with his rule. The kingdom is what it's like when God's truly king over our world. It's what happens when his will is done. And Jesus made it available to us and will bring it into its fullness when he returns and reunites heaven and earth into one. So Jesus here is proclaiming his kingdom. He's talking about who's blessed in his kingdom. So what's Jesus doing in his Beatitudes? Well, the philosopher Dallas Willard, who outside of Jesus is the greatest influence on my understanding of life in the kingdom, wrote this. The Beatitudes in particular are not teachings on how to be blessed. They're not instructions to do anything. They do not indicate conditions that are especially pleasing to God or good for human beings. No one's actually told they're better off for being poor or mourning, for being persecuted, and so on. Or that the conditions listed are recommended, recommended ways to well, of well-being before God or man. 
Nor are the Beatitudes are indications, or sorry, nor are the Beatitudes indication of who will be on top after the revolution. They're explanations and illustrations drawn from the immediate setting of the present availability of the kingdom through personal relationship to Jesus. They single out cases that provided proof that in him the rule of God from the heavens truly is available in life circumstances that are beyond all human hope. These are not instructions. These are a proclamation. A proclamation on the now available kingdom of God and who the kingdom is available to. Now, in first century Israel, you're used to proclamations of good news of a kingdom. This happened all the time. The only difference is the kingdom that was being proclaimed was not God's kingdom, but Rome's kingdom. And that king wasn't Jesus, but instead Caesar. Now, think about Rome. They come marching in with an army who needs to be fed and paid. So they take your food, and they start taxing you. And then they take your land because they need more land to grow crops, like Pompey did a century before Jesus uh, was born. He was a Roman governor, or Roman general. And they make you work your own land. And if you complain or push back, they crucify you. This is the good news of Rome. When Caesar's heralds come into town, it's not good news for the poor, the sad, the hungry, or rejected. Instead, it's just more bad news. And for those who aren't these things, chances are, you'll become them. For Rome, the blessed ones would be the rich, the well-fed, the laughing, and the honored. But we hear, what we hear as Jesus proclaims his kingdom is the opposite. He says what we'd least expect in that situation. He says that in his kingdom, it's those on the bottom side of power who are blessed. In his kingdom, the poor belong, that their hunger will be satisfied, and that while they're weeping now, they will one day laugh that through their affiliation with him, they might be caused, uh, or they might be rejected by the rich and the powerful, just as he will be, but they're restoring up a reward in the heavens. And why are they blessed? Well, simply because they have a place in his kingdom. Because as he healed and touched them, as he set them free from demonic affliction, his kingdom had come to them. I haven't spent a ton of time with, with the show The Chosen. I know a lot of you have, though. But there's something I found that was so brilliant about it as I was listening to a podcast with one of the creators. And if you don't know, The Chosen is a, a story about Jesus' disciples and their interactions with him. In the show, Jesus is talking to Matthew, one of the disciples, about the Beatitudes. And he calls them a map. And Matthew asks him, how are they like a map? To which Jesus responds with this. They're a map. If someone wants to find me, those are the groups they should look for. If someone wants to find me, those are the groups they should look for. If you want to find Jesus, find the poor, the hungry, the weeping, the rejected. Find the hopeless, because that's where he is. Or as he says, what you've done for the least of these, you've done for me. He's saying, while your plight right now is leaving you hopeless, you can have great hope because true reality doesn't look like Rome. True reality looks like my kingdom, and my kingdom is a place of blessing. But it doesn't just have blessing. Instead, he has strong words for those who Rome would bless. Those who've elevated themselves at the expense of others. He dips into the language of Micah and the other prophets and speaks a woe, a warning of upcoming judgment, that if you walk in the ways of Rome, this kingdom that looks more like Satan, then you're heaping judgment on yourself. Why? First of all, because in the first century, the vast majority of people in Israel lived in poverty, taxed the hilts, no longer living on their ancestral lands that dated back to the time of the conquest under Joshua. And so how did you become rich? It was at the expense of others. It was through oppression. And not only that, though, there's something else that goes with it. It's that they're looking for blessing or fullness or the good life in riches. Listen to the woes again. Woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how your ancestors treated the false prophets. What are the, the, those who Jesus is speaking these woes over about? They're after their own comfort and being well thought of. 
And so they do what they can, and they say what they can to get what they need. Just like the false prophets would tell the kings what they wanted to hear so that they could have a place in the courts. The rich would chase after comfort at the expense of others so they could get what they needed. The kingdom doesn't belong to them, not because there's no space for them, but because they don't want the kingdom to belong to them in the first place. When they would hear the good news of the kingdom, to, the, <clears throat> excuse me, to them it doesn't sound like good news. If they actually entered in this kingdom, it would cost them everything they've chased, chased after. And for them, that cost would be too great. If you're wondering more about that, read the story of the rich young ruler later on in Luke. And so the question then becomes, what do we do with this proclamation of the kingdom? How do we respond? Well, I think the first thing we can do is that we can get mixed up. And we can think this is a guide of how to live and how to be blessed by God. Instructions on how to be godly or things that will please God. Because we have the tendency to be binary or black and white. We make lists of right and wrong, good and bad, acceptable and unacceptable. And so what could be our tendency is to suggest that everyone who is poor, hungry, sad, and rejected is good, and everybody who is rich, well-fed, laughing, and honored is bad. And so we decide that to be a person in the kingdom, we need to be poor, starving, sad, and rejected like some stereotypical starving artist. And we get the, opinion, or the perspective that the spiritual life is really dour and serious. It's like Dallas Willard again says, the beatitude simply cannot be good news if we understand and be how-tos for achieving blessedness. That would only be a new legalism. They would not serve to throw open the kingdom, anything but. They would impose a brand new Phariseeism, a new way of closing the door, as well as some very, very gratifying new possibilities for the human engineering of righteousness. The religious spirit wants to rob us of the good part of the good news, to trade one legalism for another. But this is not the way of Jesus. Instead, his good news really is good news. And if you're wondering if I'm making this up, just look at Jesus. When you look at Jesus, as you read the stories of him in the Gospels, do you see someone who is dour and serious? No, we see in Jesus both the man of sorrows weeping over Jerusalem due to its impending destruction and the joking rabbi who's accused of being a glutton and a drunkard because he hangs out with the wrong crowds. We see Jesus as someone the kids want to be around. And if you're grumpy and dour, do kids want to be with you? No. We see him both without a home, but being cared for by his community. We see him hungry, fasting for 40 days, but we also see him taking part in wedding feasts and providing a meal for thousands with many leftovers. Or look at the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. It's love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And these are the best descriptors of Jesus. Is somebody who is full of love and joy and peace and so on, somebody who's dour and serious? No, right? And so we need to put this in the right perspective. This isn't ways that we can become more spiritual or more close to Jesus by uh, taking part in um, by taking part in giving away everything and getting hungry and stuff like that. Instead, it's realizing that Jesus' kingdom is open to people that we might not expect. Secondly, though and this is a counterbalance, we need to take Jesus' warnings about wealth and its pursuit seriously. Because as we will see in Luke's gospel, this is a common theme. As we will read in Luke again and again, the rich and the powerful are criticized for living life independent from God and oppressing the poor. It's something we already saw in Luke 1, to 53, where Mary proclaims of God. He's performed mighty deeds with his arm. He scattered those who are proud in their innermost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but he's lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things, but he's sent the rich away empty. We'll see rich young rulers walk away from following Jesus because they're too attached to their wealth. We'll hear Jesus say the seed that falls among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked out by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. We'll hear Jesus tell stories about rich fools who build bigger barns to provide for themselves, and a rich man who oppresses a poor man named Lazarus. 
It's the rich and powerful that will ultimately oppose and kill Jesus. Luke has a lot to say about wealth. But we'll also read in Luke about a powerful and wealthy tax collector named Zacchaeus who enters into the kingdom through the doorway of generosity. For Luke, wealth, or for Jesus in Luke, wealth isn't neutral. It will draw us towards greed and scarcity. It will pull us towards a life of self-satisfaction. It will seek to be our Lord, to get us to focus on it, to orient our lives around it, to worship it, to what the scriptures call idolatry. It's like the New Testament scholar Mark Strauss will say, or says in his commentary on Luke, the physically poor are spiritually advantaged because their poverty fosters reliance on God. The physically rich are spiritually disadvantaged because their wealth represents a danger and a hindrance to putting God first. So as we continue into Luke, let's be open to Jesus and what he has to say about our wealth, about our stuff, about our possessions, and our attachment to it. Let's be people who ask good questions. Like, how is my lifestyle negatively affecting others and contributing to their poverty? Questions like, are the economic systems of this world that lift up a few and push down many, are they any different from Rome? Questions like, what is my relationship to my possessions? Or what's keeping me from the kingdom? And let's continue praying the giving liturgy together, seeking to align our lives with the kingdom and its generosity and abundance. But let's remember, Jesus isn't against rich people. Some of the most generous people I know are people who are rich. And they've aligned themselves with the values of Jesus' kingdom and are constantly going, how can I bless others with what I have? They've been trusted with much and are proving to be trustworthy with it. But Jesus wants us to put it in right perspective. Friends, Jesus isn't replacing the rich with the poor or the laughing with the weeping. Instead, in the Beatitudes, he's opening the door to all who've been told, you can't be blessed, you don't belong, you have no place in the kingdom. And lastly, as a community, we need to align ourselves around this message. If we are kingdom people, then the hopeless, here exemplified by the poor, the hungry, the weeping, the rejected, will find a place where they can belong here. If we are truly kingdom people. We need to exist as a community, and I think we're doing a pretty good job of it. We need to exist as a community in such a way that the rejected, the poor, the hungry, the weeping have a space in our kingdom, or in our church, in his kingdom. That we don't make people become something different so that they can belong. We don't say, oh, you can't weep here. Or you have to be, oh, you don't dress the right way. Or any of those things. Instead, we need to continue to become the kind of place where the hopeless can belong. This past week, I was reminded of something I've been praying for since we got this land six years ago. I was thinking about how people describe Stony as a spiritually dark place. And I was thinking of what it would be like if this land that we found ourselves on became a thin place of heaven. A thin place is a place where the veil between heaven and earth is so thin that it feels like they become one. And so for six years I've been praying that this would be a thin place of heaven. That his kingdom would come in such a way that his will would be done here. Just a simple prayer of Jesus would this place become a thin place. And this week as I pulled in the parking lot after a meeting, I found a number of our unhoused population hanging out in our parking lot. And so I stopped to say hi and see if they needed anything. And after spending some time with them and getting them some lunch and providing them with some contacts for local agencies, I walked back into my office. And as I sat down, I was reminded of that prayer. That, Jesus, would you make this a thin place? And I wonder if maybe Jesus is starting to answer that. that as the poor and hopeless come and are seen and met with dignity, that the place between 
heaven and earth is getting a little thinner. So I wonder if, if any of you, and I can feel this way often, feel like uh, there's a distance between you and Jesus. I wonder if the invitation is simply follow the map. If you're feeling distant, get around the poor, the hungry, the weeping, the rejected. Get around people who are hopeless because Jesus is, is found there. Like he said, what you do for the least of these, you do for me. Which also means that the kingdom can be an uncomfortable place to live sometimes. Because we're going to be around people we don't understand, who are living in ways we don't understand or maybe agree with. But we find them encountering Jesus. There may be things that are difficult or uncomfortable for us. And that temptation can always come back to draw up walls of religiosity or something to give strings on the good news of the kingdom but may we follow Jesus so closely and listen so deeply that that doesn't happen. May it be said of us that we're truly people of good news. People who care for the poor, the hungry, the weeping, the rejected. May it be said of us that we are a blessing, that we are the kind of people who show the good news and proclaim it. Now, if you're the kind of person who's hearing this and getting excited, um, Please go talk to Linda. Uh, she's one of our pastors. Or uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, visit our Justice and Compassion booth at our ministry fair. This is space we want to walk into more and more. The invitation of Jesus to be good news both locally and globally is one of our big focuses for the coming year. Also, if you find yourself in one of these camps, and we all find ourselves in different times and different places, people who are rejected, poor, hungry, weeping. If you're finding yourself in a place that feels hopeless, know that you're in an okay place because Jesus is with you. That his kingdom has a space for you. Would you let us know so we could come alongside you to care for you, to be with you, to support you? There's no shame in Christ's kingdom. So don't keep shame from asking, or to keep shame from keeping you from asking for help. So we're about to come to the table right now. And Laura, as you come up, my communion stuff I think is on that chair. <laughs> I forgot my, my uh, communion cup. Can you bring it for me? Um, the band's going to come up, and uh, we're going to do another song. But um, as we come to the table, I wonder if you're struggling with feeling unseen. That there's something about you that you feel like Jesus would reject. That you've been told your case is too hopeless even for Jesus or he doesn't like your kind of people. Remind you all that are welcome at the table. It is a place of mercy. And so if you're in the need of mercy to, today, you're in the right place. The table is a place of hope. Here you can know that Jesus sees you. Maybe as you come to the table, you need to meet Jesus with your tension this morning. You've heard words about riches and there's a pit there or an anger or sadness or who knows. Would you honestly bring that to the table? Say, Jesus, I don't know how to understand what you have to say here, but I know that you're with me. Help me to be with you. Maybe you've heard wrong or false teaching that's pushed you down, telling you you need to be healthy and wealthy, and that's how you know how you're blessed. Let's name that for what it is that is false teaching. The kingdom of Jesus doesn't look like you get material possessions. Instead, we follow Jesus in his kingdom, and his kingdom, his way, led right through the cross. So we can expect suffering on our way through, too. And so if you've heard false teaching that says, because of health complications or family breakdown or poverty or some sort of suffering, you do not have the blessing of Jesus, would this morning be a time where you can just say no to that, to break that off? Can you bring that to Jesus at the table and allow him to undo it with the truth that he blesses you? And so may we see the table as a place where the doors are open wide. 
but it's up to us to come through the door and sit down. He won't force us. And so as we come to the table, if you don't have your stuff, you can get it. Remember, I had to as well. As we come to the table, uh, just if you haven't used these before, push down. It's easier to get into. It feels a little less like Fort Knox. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. Let's break it together. He gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's eat in remembrance of him. Then Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and he passed it. And he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Let's drink in remembrance of him. And every time we come to the table, we remember the gospel, the good news of the kingdom that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ is reigning, and Christ will come again. Amen.